plenary session of the labor, 63rd Labor Economics Conference. I request all of you to please take your seats. This is a panel on climate change, livelihoods and employment being organized by Institute for Human Development, New Delhi and the International, International Labor Organization. The panel is being chaired by Dr. Jerry Rogers. He is visiting professor at the Institute for Human Development, New Delhi and the former director of the International Institute of Labor Studies, ILO Geneva. I request Jerry to please come on the dais. The panelists in this session are Dr. Nicola Maitre, Research Department, ILO Geneva. Uh, he could not join us in person. He'll be connected with us on Zoom. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you all for participating in, in this event at this late, at this late hour. Uh, and many thanks to the organizers for the wel welcoming environment um, and the wonderful support team that uh, that makes life so much easier for all of us. Now, I suppose I, I hardly need to explain why the ISLE is holding a plenary panel on the topic of climate change, employment and livelihoods. This is a major issue for the future of all societies, as few people now deny that this is a priority for research and policy. There are major consequences of climate change and of environmental issues more generally for production, for employment, for social policy, for incomes and welfare, for inequality, for health, for productivity, and the list goes on. Um, and it's already been said, by the way, that this is an issue of particular concern in, in this beautiful state of Arunachal Pradesh. Um, but this is not an area that has really been much the focus of much research by labor economists, um, or from a labor perspective uh, in India or elsewhere. The, the ISLE's executive committee then, and in particular um, the conference president, uh, Jimal Ni, uh, supported the idea that there should be an open debate on these issues which could help to set a future agenda. And the background notes in the conference materials highlights some of the, some of the issues and relationships that might be considered. Draws attention to three broad aspects of the impact of climate change, um, consequences for production and employment, impact on working conditions, and the implications of policy choices for behavior and welfare, and suggests a number of questions that might be considered as the subject of future research. So there's more detail in the background notes, and I won't elaborate on that, because we have an eminent panel of specialists who are well-placed to share with you and with us their expertise on these issues. Now, putting together the panel proved to be a little complicated because of, of visa and permit issues. So we have a mix of, uh, of video presentations and participation in, in person. Let me, I will introduce briefly all of the speakers at the beginning and then uh, um, we don't need to do it before each one speaks. So the first speaker, in a video presentation will be Nicolas Maitre, who is an economist in the ILO's research department, who has authored or co-authored several ILO reports on climate change and green jobs. And he will highlight some of the key environmental issues on the ILO agenda and the ILO strategy to address them. And he's also joining us online, but as a measure of precaution, we thought it was better to have his um, his uh, presentation recorded um, in case the, the connection was not very good, but he should be. We are there. Are you, you're there, Nicola. So, so Nicola is here to join in the discussion afterwards. Second speaker will be Barbara Harris-White from Oxford, who's well known to many of you. She's made many, many contributions to the analysis and documentation of, of development and non-development in, in India and has been addressing environmental issues in much of her recent field-based work in rural India. And she will, in particular, talk about changing food systems under climate change conditions and the consequences for jobs. Then the third speaker, uh, Pranab Mukhopadhyay, is Professor of Economics at Goa University, active in the Indian Society for Ecological uh, 
Economics, uh, a sister organization to the ISLE. Um, I'm not sure if I've got the gender right, actually. Uh, he also works in the South Asian Network um, uh, for research on these issues, Sandy, and is editor of the journal Ecology, Economy, and Society. And he'll present some of the findings from research um, on uh, climate change, um, particularly natural disasters in, in South Asia. Uh, next, there will be a video presentation by Diane Archer, who works with the Swedish Environmental Institute in Bangkok. She has worked on urban poverty and environmental issues and on the adaptation of cities to climate change. And her presentation will give a gendered perspective on impacts and rights of workers um, faced with uh, air pollution and climate uh, change issues in Asia. Um, if time permits, we will also um, draw on a short um, uh, PowerPoint presentation about the environmental situation in Myanmar, which has been prepared by Win Myo Tu, who's an activist and development practitioner on climate change and environmental conservation. Uh, he's presently based at Christchurch uh, College, Oxford, and um, unfortunately he couldn't uh, join us because of visa issues. Um, and our discussant is, is uh, Professor S. Nadeshwaran, who is well known to ISLE, of course, professor at ISEC Bangalore and advisor to the government of Karnataka. He has, as you are uh, no doubt aware, published very widely on labor issues, including on their environmentalist aspects. And then after Nadeshwaran's comments, we'll open the floor um, for, other, for questions and contributions. So first, we will, we will see Nicola Metre's presentation. And the technical team is busy organizing it. There we go. Hi everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I would like, first of all, to thank the organizer of the ISLD conference for inviting me. Unfortunately, I'm not able to be here in person with you, but it's a great honor for me to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience through this video. My name is Nicolas Maitre, and I am an economist in the research department of the ILO, and today my presentation will focus on the link between the natural environment and the world. Sorry, can we... Uh, in particular... I'll, could we pause? Can, can, can everybody hear? Because up here it sounds... But the... The room might, in the room it might be okay. Can, 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 can you hear it okay? Yes, you can, because up here it sounds very distorted, but down there... Okay, so, so if you... Okay, so, so that's fine. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. We will look at the various channels to which environmental de degradation can affect the world of work with a specific focus on the impact of its stress on labor. We will also look at how the transition toward a green economy can affect employment in terms of job creation and job destruction. But before entering into these key findings, let me give you some information on the institutional framework of the ILO regarding these issues. First of all, it is important to note that environmental sustainability is a key issue for the ILO. And it has received growing importance uh, during the last 10 years. In 2013, the ILO launched the Green Initiative as one of the seven initiatives to mark its centenary. In 2015, the ILO governing body adopted the guidelines for a just transition toward environmentally sustainable economies and societies for all. These guidelines provide both a policy framework and a practical tool to help countries managing their green transition. More recently, in 2019, the ILO Centenary Declaration recognized climate and environmental changes as key drivers of the transformation of the world of work. So it is in this overall context that the research department, and specifically the unit in which I'm working, have been strongly engaged in strengthening the capacity of the organization on the topic. By doing so, we have produced numerous reports and working papers on the link between the environment and the world of work. 
Among these reports, it produced the World Economic and Social Outlook, Greening with Jobs in 2018, as well as a report on the impact of its stress on labor productivity and so forth. So let me now present some of the key findings of these two reports in the coming slides. First, as many of you know, the world of work is very closely related to the natural environment in many uh, aspects. First, jobs in many sectors rely on scarce and finite natural resources, and the increasing scarcity of these resources threaten the jobs in this sector. For example, this is particularly the case in the mining industry. Secondly, economic activity in many sectors depends on what we call ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are basically services that are provided free of charge by the natural environment. These are, for example, rainfall for the irrigation, but also the ability of the soil to regenerate its nutrients, or the ability of the ocean to re renew its fish stock. At the global level, we estimated that 1.2 billion jobs rely on these ecosystem services. This represents approximately 40% of the total employment. In India, these represent 194 million jobs, which is equivalent to 52% of the um, employed population. Another example of the tight link between the natural environment and the world of work is that jobs rely on a healthy and stable natural environment. However, the natural environment is becoming uh, more and more unstable and unhealthy. And for example, increasing frequency and intensity of natural disaster, but also heat stress, have major consequences on working conditions and productivity. Finally, environmental degradation tends to affect vulnerable workers the most, and so it generates more and more inequality. So tackling uh, climate change is also a matter of social justice. For the sake of this presentation, let's focus our attention on one effect of climate change, which relates to the impact of heat stress on labor productivity. So, heat stress refers to a situation where it's too hot to work, or at least too hot to work at a normal intensity. It endangers the safety and health of workers, and uh, increase the risk of injuries and uh, heat related illnesses. When we face heat stress, a natural uh, defense to combat the effect of heat stress is to reduce uh, or slow down our work, increase the number of breaks, and reduce the number of working hours. All those measures have consequences on labor productivity by reducing the labor productivity. This reduction of labor productivity can result in loss of income, especially for vulnerable workers, such as informal workers or self-employed workers. So in our 2019 report, we calculated the impact of heat stress on productivity at the global level, regional level and national level for two years, 1995 and 2013. The the figure that I'm presenting right now shows the percentage of working hour loss due to its stress in 2030 for the different regions and at the uh, global level. As we can see, we estimated that 2.2% of total working hour will be lost due to its stress uh, worldwide in 2030, which is equivalent to a loss of uh, approximately 80 million full-time jobs. This impact is also unevenly distributed across the region, and the most affected regions are Southern Asia, Western Africa, and Southeast Asia. Within these uh, regions, there are also countries that are particularly affected. The following figure shows the 10 most affected countries in Asia and the Pacific. As you can see, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, India, and Bangladesh are among the most affected countries, with losses surpassing 5% of uh, working hours. For example, in India, we estimated that as much as 5.8% of all the working hours will be lost due to its stress in 2030. 
We can also see that climate change has worsened the situation between 95 and 2013 in India. Uh, and the loss increased by 1.5% between 95 and 2013. So if nothing is done to mitigate the effect of climate change, we can expect this loss to increase more and more in the coming uh, years. The impact of heat stress is also unevenly distributed across sectors. This figure shows how the losses are distributed across four different sectors, which are agriculture, construction, industry, and services. As you can see, at the global level, uh, we estimate that agriculture and construction workers will account for respectively 60% and 90%, 19% of the losses. This is because two reasons. First, these are jobs that are physically more intense, and secondly, they are carried out outside at direct exposure of the radiation of the sun. In, in uh, Central and Eastern Africa, more than 90% of the loss will be in the agricultural work, in the agricultural sector. This is due to their heavy reliance on uh, agriculture. So all these results shows that the adaptation measures and adaptation policies are really needed to protect workers against the effect of heat stress. In fact, government, workers and employers should work together through social dialogue to implement these adaptation measures. For instance, government play a crucial role in uh, providing information to workers and employers, but also in creating an appropriate regulatory framework that protects workers' health and safety. For it, for example, in terms of uh, information, a government can provide information on future heat levels, but also on the risk associated to uh, heat stress and the measure that uh, should be implemented at the workplace. Regarding workers and employers, they are best placed to implement these adaptation measures and to take appropriate action at the workplace. This uh, adaptation measure can include uh, adapting the number of breaks, adapting the access to water, or adapting the, the working hours to, to face the, the impact of, uh, of it. Finally, social dialogue is crucial in the development of national policies, including policies on occupational safety and health, but also in reaching a consensus on working methods between workers and employers. While all these adaptation measures are really needed in the short term, in the long term, climate change mitigation is indispensable if occupational heat stress is to be prevented. Climate change mitigation refers to tackling the root cause of uh, climate change, or in other words, it refers to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But mitigation of climate change will imply a structural transformation of the economy, and as in any structural transformation, jobs will be created in certain sectors and destroyed in others. So what would be the net impact of the transition uh, toward an environmentally sustainable economy on employment? In fact, according to our report Greening with Jobs, advancing toward a green economy can create a net employment benefit, a net employment gain at the global level. The figure shows the employment impact of taking action in the energy sector to limit global warming to 2 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. As we can see, taking measures to green uh, the energy sector can generate a total employment benefit of, 20, of 18 million new jobs worldwide by 2030. This is the result of a creation of 24 million new jobs and the destruction of 6 million jobs in, in some sectors. At the regional level, we can see that the transition will lead to job creation, to net job creation in the Americas, in Asia and the Pacific, and in Europe. However, in the Middle East and in Africa, this will result in slight uh, job destruction. This is uh, mostly explained by their heavy reliance on fossil fuel and the mining industry. Looking at India, 
the greening the energy sector can lead to the creation of approximately 2.8 million jobs uh, in the country by 2030. However, because there is a reallocation of, uh, of jobs and because in certain sectors some of these jobs will be lost, there is a need for policies to ensure that the transition is just, fair, and that no one is left uh, behind. In our report, we discuss three policy areas that are crucial for a just transition to ensure that the just transition is uh, socially fair and inclusive. These are an appropriate legal framework, social protection, and skill development. Regarding the legal framework, it can provide incentive for greening the economy while ensuring decent work. For example, many ILO instruments on occupational safety and health contain measures that also contribute to the protection of the environment. The, regarding social protection, social protection is crucial to protect workers from both the effect of environmental degradation and the structural transformation to sustainability. There are at least four types of programs that can be that can simultaneously uh, target environmental and social objectives, and these are unemployment benefits, cash transfer, public employment programs, or payment for ecosystem services. For instance, in countries like Kenya or Ethiopia, some cash transfer are used to protect workers against natural disasters, the effects of natural disasters. Finally, without skill development, there will be no just transition. Because skill development allows workers to make the transition to green sectors during the transition, during the structural transformation. In addition, skills promote productive employment and decent work. But it also comes with many challenges. In particular, the identification of skill needed for the green transition is a challenge that many countries are facing. In addition, the implementation of skills programs should be uh, implemented in a spirit of equity that promotes inclusive access to the labor market. In conclusion, if we were to summarize this presentation with three key messages, I would say that the takeaway messages are the following. First, for the world of work, a transition to environmental sustainability is urgent. As we have just seen, many jobs in the economy are threatened by environmental degradation, especially in the agriculture sector, the mining industry, or the construction. Secondly, advancing towards sustainability is compatible with positive employment effects. As we have seen, greening the energy sector, for instance, can create about 80 million jobs worldwide. Finally, a just transition requires complementary policies and coherency between environmental and social policies. For further information, I invite you to consult our uh, different reports on the topic, which are freely available on the ILO webpage. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, before I begin my short talk, I want to say how grateful I am to the IHD and also to RGU for organizing this and for inviting me and making it possible for me to be here. And how grateful I am to be back at an ILS International Society of Labour Economics conference and back in Arunachal and back in India after several years of COVID and only contact by Zoom from Oxford. Um, and I missed India enormously during those years, but during those years, um, some members of a very brilliant generation of applied economists left us. And in my mind, I'm thinking of Rohini Nair and Sheila Bala and Ajit Ghosh, whom um, Ashwini uh, paid tribute to in her lecture, and Manik Sen, uh, Professor Radhakrishna in Hyderabad and Professor Alag in Gujarat. And there are many others who have left us because of COVID or during these COVID years. 
And I'm thinking that the next generation, those of you who are still here at this session, can pay tribute to them by doing research on some of the biggest problems of our times. Seven sectors in the Indian economy, if I get it right, iron and steel, energy, cement, chemicals, um, aluminium, paper, and I forget the seventh, but they provide, they generate 70% of all greenhouse gases. Um, the food system itself, if we count the post-harvest system as well as production, generates about 35% nobody really knows, of greenhouse gases. And people who can count are already thinking uh, that's more than 100%, and there will be double counting. And when we look at jobs, not the least, because informal labor and formal labor weave in and out of these systems. They interconnect in ways which we don't fully understand. Um, Nicholas just now was talking about the employment effects of sustainability, and that's what I want to talk about as well. What is to be done about unregulated jobs, given climate change? And I'm going to be talking about mitigation, which is a very unpopular subject in India. Although Nicholas was just saying that for the world, mitigation is indispensable. We might have an argument about that afterwards. And I'm going to talk about the food system, not one of these big energy gener uh, greenhouse gas generative uh, sectors of the economy, but the food system, because I know that best. And there are people sitting here, Professor Dimol and Professor Kunal, who have sliced the economy in different ways. And what I say to people who are working on other parts of the economy is, can you use the method that I'm going to introduce to calculate the greenhouse gas emissions of different parts of the economy, and then the greenhouse gas emissions of solutions, of technological solutions to the problems that we identify through calculating greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. So, are you sure that's, yeah, okay. It's, it's a bit weird not to be in control of one's slides. Um, this is a slide to show you um, the complexity of the food system. It's not a slide you need to read. It's a slide that you simply take away the complexity of. On the left is the post-harvest system in West Bengal. Um, at the bottom is production, which is even more complicated. And the diagram consists of units of capital performing functions in, this, in the food system, and the lines are paddy and rice. Now to calculate greenhouse gases, we have to simplify. So the system on the right is vastly simplified in order to calculate greenhouse gases. Next, please. But given that simplicity, which is down the middle, we can re-complicate it by calculating and mapping onto it a number of variables, which as you as labor economists might be interested in. We can calculate um, the quantity and the quality of employment, bottom left, a whole vector of costs on the right, and then a whole set of environmental variables, energy in various forms, greenhouse gas emissions currently, and the greenhouse gas emissions which are embodied in the material that is used at every stage of production and distribution. So we regenerate a kind of complexity which enables us to calculate greenhouse gases and then examine the trade-off between greenhouse gases, costs and profits, and the quality and quantity of labor. Next, please. <clears throat> so to cut a long story short, the results of our fieldwork, um, I think the slide that's missing is that we chose four systems of rice production <clears throat> going down the eastern side of India. That was rain-fed rice, SRI in Andhra Pradesh, and organic and high-yielding varieties in Tamil Nadu. And we looked at three distribution systems, the public distribution system, petty shops, and a regular um, private distribution system. So we're comparing four different kinds of rice production systems and distribution systems. So the take-home from this um, take this figure 
is that one kilo of paddy generates, whoo, it's a cat, generates one kilo of greenhouse gases. They're not statistically different, uh, significantly different, but the composition of the greenhouse gases differs. There's very little CO2 <coughs> in rain-fed rice because of lack of fertilizer and lack of coal in the electricity that is used to lift irrigation water. The dirtiest part of rice production, which includes organic rice, is irrigation water. And the methane is, is a big component, either from cattle or from the soil, and nitrous oxide, which is red, is a very large component of rain-fed rice. So take home the fact that rice, a kilo of rice produces, a kilo of paddy rather, produces a kilo of greenhouse gas, but the composition of that greenhouse gas changes. Okay? The next um, result is for high-yielding varieties of paddy and rice. And along the horizontal line, everything adds to 100. Each horizontal line adds to 100. So you can see the relative importance in the process of production and distribution of different uh, variables, different aspects, environmental and labor, <coughs> excuse me, and then costs and profits. And again, this is a complicated diagram, but the take home is that the environmental costs are really loaded in production and are less important in distribution, which was a bit of a surprise to me. And um, it is distribution which is more labor intensive um, and more uh, and grabs a higher percentage of total costs and profits. It's, it's loaded against distribution and environment is loaded against production. Next slide, please. Okay, so having got this result, the question is what is to be done? Lenin's question for the 21st century. Um, and what is to be done about reducing greenhouse gases inside a system like this? With what technology and what kind of jobs would be displaced or would be created? Now, I'm talking about the food system, but the methods are actually quite transferable to any sector of the economy. I won't say much about this slide. All of you know about cost-benefit analysis, where subsidies are undistorted and the flow of costs and benefits are discounted from the future to the present by a rate which represents the cost, the real cost of capital to society. Now, ever since this method was devised, it has been criticized. And in the case that we have here, with a whole system <coughs> and system hotspots, one needs to, to be looking at more than one technological solution. One technological solution inside this system is not going to uh, produce much of a result. So, next slide, please. One systematic alternative, which was developed since the Second World War by engineers rather than economists, <coughs> excuse me, is called multi-criteria analysis or multi-criteria mapping. And it's been developed from the intuition that when we make choices, we don't only calculate in dollars. Um, we use a range of decision parameters. And for a car, for instance, firstly, the cost, yes, that's dollars, all right. But the color, the shape, the fuel efficiency, the emissions for some, the quality and the safety record. And the point is that a given technology may not perform equally well under all these criteria. And that the, dis the criteria that we use cannot be reduced to dollars and are what is called incommensurable. So multi-criteria analysis is a, a technique used mostly in engineering, also in public health. And it claims, and I think it's true, that it helps contribute to the public accountability of science and policy debates because it involves consultation with members of the public who then rank the criteria that one chooses to evaluate by numbers which are then commensurable and which can be combined in a very simple way. Um, and in doing this experiment, asking what is to be done inside a food system, I think that the method has shown that it can be transferred to other topics in agroecology, in the circular economy, or other sectors of the economy. Next slide, please. 
So, in order to carry this out, um, one needs to be clear about the framing because one's going to have to defend that framing in a conversation with a large number of people. In this case, uh, we needed to be clear about the fact we had multiple objectives, technology which reduced greenhouse gases, which was profitable, and which um, provided jobs, either the same number or a larger number, and either the uh, same quality of jobs or better jobs. So that framing was very important, and we recognized that the jobs and greenhouse gases and costs might be traded off against one another. Then the options. Um, for you, the options are better, more intelligible as technologies. These were really difficult to find, and in trying to scope technologies for four kinds of rice production distribution systems, what we discovered was that the literature is not helpful at all. It's carved up through intellectual property rights or patents. Um, it's carved up institutionally. A lot of the literature on technology doesn't include labor, and a lot of, especially the literature which looks at greenhouse gases. So in the end, we found four technologies where the literature satisfied the options criteria of costs and returns, labor, and greenhouse gases. And they were rain-fed rice, which is standing in for millet, um, SRI, systems of rice intensification, solar pumps, and finally something where the costs are public costs, not private costs, reducing transmission and distribution losses in the electricity system. Next slide, please. Um, so in order to concretize and implement, practically implement, this method, we had to have some kind of a theory of stakeholders. We do not have a random sample, that's something to be developed, but we had the idea that people with different positions in society, with rural and urban locations, with different levels of education, different genders, would probably rank the options that we had found in a different way. So that was a hypothesis which I can anticipate actually failed. There is really very little difference in the social positioning of the 40 people that we consulted about technology and jobs. It's, uh, there's no point in doing a statistical test, but there's really no very big difference. And the stunning result was not men and women, but um, by and large, experts like you didn't really differ very much in the evaluation from illiterate and innumerate agricultural laborers, which really gave us pause for thought. Next slide. So, rain-fed rice, if you, um, down on the left-hand side are the options that we used, and across um, on the columns are the criteria. So, rain-fed rice reduces um, costs, um, certainly reduces yields compared with high-yielding varieties, reduces greenhouse gases, and provides masses more labor, but it's unskilled agricultural labor. SRI reduces costs, increases yields, uh, reduces greenhouse gases enormously, and provides more labor. Solar pumps have high front-loaded capital costs, but are only really uh, feasible with a huge subsidy from the state. No change in yields, a reduction in greenhouse gas, less unskilled labor, but more skilled labor in maintenance. And transmission and distribution losses um, are, are costly, but they are a public cost, which is recouped through reduced electricity losses. No change in, in, in agricultural yields, a, big, a, a reduction in greenhouse gases, and no change in agricultural labor, but generating more off-farm skilled labor. So those were the options that we took to a, a public consultation, half of which were educated people, and half of which consisted of people who had situated knowledge, knowledge gained through life experience. Most of them were small farmers, and some of them were agricultural laborers. So we had a vast cross-section of society. Next slide, please. Next slide. Right, so the quantitative analysis is almost immaterial, but if you're interested in the substance, Yes, it, it was feasible and practicable, and yes, it produced a result. But the result is that, by and large, the four options um, didn't produce one option which was obviously better 
on these three criteria. I don't have enough time to talk about trade-offs, but there were trade-offs between greenhouse gases, um, jobs, and costs, and returns. But because I don't have a lot of time, um, I, I thought I would focus, in the few minutes left, on the qualitative results. Because in the public consultation, we learned a lot, and we actually uh, incorporated some of what we learned from the consultation back into the, uh, the, the final rounds of the consultation. Next slide, please. So the qualitative insights, um, I think, are useful to an audience of labor economists because they show that our categories and the categories of the literature are often not the categories experienced by the people that we're talking to in the field. In particular, the, the idea that we can somehow proxy the ecological crisis by climate change is proved utterly reductionist. And small farmers and laborers who saw apartment blocks charging towards their paddy fields don't actually distinguish between climate change and development. They knew about heat trapping gases. They knew about weather becoming irregular. They knew very well about the stinking fields. They can see the methane bubbling through their fields. Women complained about damage to the water table because that affects their work burden. And they saw destructive um, uh, invasions of insects and degraded grazing ground. But the effects of climate change by itself are not distinguishable from the effects of development. Secondly, on the average, labor and jobs were valued least highly of the three criteria, jobs, costs, and greenhouse gases. People with situated knowledge, the small farmers and laborers, valued jobs more highly than educated people. Women valued higher tech jobs more highly than men. And women were much more alive to the effects of labor displacement than men. The category of unskilled labor, which we all use because it's an official category, was challenged by unskilled labor. They said, you try it. And they emphasized the wide range of mind and body coordination that are necessary in jobs that we consider unskilled. And the drudgery and the pain that they cause and the control of the human body that is necessary in order to perform that work in agriculture. They also reminded us of something which the literature didn't mention at all, which is the implications of technology, not just on human work, but on the work of animals and the work of humans um, caring for animals, which affected some of the evaluations of the riskiness of some of these new technological options which ought to mitigate greenhouse gases. Next slide, please. Jobs weren't experienced as a status or a category. Jobs were actually experienced as a dynamic process. People saw jobs as a route for innovation, as a way of being able to experiment technologically, as a way of leaping in terms of skills, and also as an opportunity for privatize, private privatization of public assets and theft. They also reminded us that collective action, which often as labor economists, we invoke as a residual policy implication when we can't see another way out of a problem, is actually very costly. And again and again, especially considering solar pumps, which wouldn't work without collective action by small farmers, we, we learned how transactions costly collective action is, how difficult it is to make it work. People with situated knowledge were mostly Dalit and uh, were very uh, clear about the need for Dalit women and Dalit children to stop working in food production. However, they also explained that the alternative was affected right from the start by discrimination in school, by discrimination in education, and an effective lack of training. So that the non-farm economy, which is the obvious alternative to agriculture, was a very rotten prospect for Dalits. They thought we underestimated in our calculations of labor, the management costs of labor, the uncertainties of labor, and that we didn't ever 
consider, because the literature doesn't consider the impact of work on health, which has been raised in this conference. And lastly, educated people, people with expert knowledge, tended to answer the questions that we asked them for their, their opinions on as trustees for the poor rather than as direct stakeholders, which is something we should have foreseen but came out very definitely from this experiment in public consultation. Next slide, please. I've got two more slides which simply uh, cover the implications of this experiment and what we learned about new technology which reduces greenhouse gases and may conserve jobs. And they both concern information. That we, we're looking at the food system, but I think anybody looking at any sector of India's economy needs better knowledge than is available in the literature. If India were serious about a low carbon future or a lower carbon future, you would need a big database on existing jobs to know how the technologies through which that's to be achieved affect labor and what their implications are for the labor force. Last slide, please. And the other, um, the other consequence of this work um, came out of the extremely difficult experience of trying to scope alternative technologies and that very flawed, uneven literature. And it seems to me that if the world is serious, in the, in the way that Nicolas just said through the ILO, if the world is serious about a lower carbon future and a just transition, then the UN needs a portal in the major languages of the world for low tech carbon or low greenhouse gas, or now it's called nature positive technology, throughout food systems and other sectors of the economy in all the agroecological regions specifying materials, energy, greenhouse gas emissions, other ecological or environmental benefits, livelihoods and employment, intellectual property rights and patents, and costs and finance. Because without that data, that the technology is going to be extremely hard to find and develop. So that's my last point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara. You've given us a new angle on the subject, looking at the complexities of moving towards a low carbon economy and integrating that move with the issues that we're concerned with in terms of social justice, employment, and the participation of people in those, in those lives. Jobs as a dynamic process. I think it's a nice way of trying to think about it. So thank you very much. Um, so so um, I'm sorry that we all sort of leave the stage and come down here, but all, all, the, all the loudspeakers are, are pointing that way, and when you're on the stage, you really can't, can't hear what is being said. So the next speaker is Pranab Mukhopadhyay. Let's get sorted out. Uh, let me do a few preliminary things that I want to say right away. I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, Professor Deepak Nair. Uh, I'm meeting him after almost uh, 25, 30 years, and uh, it's great sir, to be here in this conference. This is my first visit here, and uh, it's really been an educative uh, experience for me to see such a large number of people engaging on issues of labor and uh, which are of great concern to everyone. I also want to acknowledge the presence of Professor Amita Shah. She was the president of the Indian Society for Ecological Economics um, a few uh, years ago, and uh, it was really lovely connecting with her. I want to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me here. Uh, I am not a labor economist by, uh, I mean, I. My work largely doesn't relate around labor, but it seems to be converging here. And uh, to Professor Jima Alunni, uh, Professor uh, Alak Sharma, and of course my friend Professor Madheshwaran, um, which is why I'm really here. So let me get started uh, with what I'm going to talk about. There are, uh, since Jerry is sitting in the audience right now, Jerry, I have 
a bunch of slides and I was hoping Professor Inamul Haq with whom I have some work uh, that we've done together would also be here but since he isn't uh, I was hoping I would be able to present some of the uh, stuff that we have done together and if time permits uh, I will go on to that but please raise a hand if you think I'm exceeding uh, what should be uh, ethically allo allocated to me. So there are three bits to this work and it will all depend on how fast I speak and uh, how fast I can uh, get through those and uh, wherever the time exceeds I'll just stop there because uh, things can be taken on at a later point in time. So can we move on to the next slide here? Yeah. Right, so a couple of images to just remind ourselves that you know when we think of environment and we think of labor. Uh, when the lockdown first happened, and since the, this is the theme of the conference here, uh, a lot of people were excited just that the environment was clean, the air was clean, people in Delhi could uh, breathe clean air. And this image was like a striking image that reminded us that environment is important and then it requires a pandemic to tell us that, you know, what the difference can be. But at the same time, and that's been part of the... Um, theme of this conference, we also had images, uh, if you could go to the next slide please, which reminded us that this was not such a great thing to happen and that uh, there are great consequences of wanting to have this clean environment, especially when it happens at a time when people are losing jobs, people are losing their lives. And so there is a trade-off, this environment economy trade-off is real and it is, you know, it, it hits us on our face every, every day in our daily lives in this part of the world. Um, right. So the, the first bit of the work that I'm going to present to you is uh, about um, the broad macroeconomic framework with uh, which we can think of what has been the transition of a bunch of economies over the last four decades. And there's a second bit of work that looks directly at natural disasters and its impact on well-being in India. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, we are aware that you know, the Paris Agreement and the uh, commitments that we made uh, want us to achieve a ceiling of 2 degrees centigrade to pre-industrial levels and be climate neutral by 2050. And uh, this is something that we target. If we go on to the next slide. Uh, what is that, you know, what is, what is the reason why we are getting there? And the reason we are getting there is because there is an accepted theory of uh, body of knowledge which is telling us that extreme events are now uh, becoming more frequent, they're becoming more intense and the costs of disasters are growing. There's a large database that has been developed which has been tracking natural disasters across the globe and what we find is that over the last two decades the cost of disasters has actually doubled. Uh, floods have affected the largest number of people, 41% followed by droughts, which is about 35%. The top 10 countries that have reported disasters in the last two decades are, and there's a bunch of countries listed there from China onwards to Afghanistan. Uh, while China's major problem was floods, for India it was drought. So that's, that's something that is out there in the public domain for those who want details of that. Uh, the data coverage was for about 30 years um, and uh, this is taken from the UN's uh, database on the global policy model. Um, it covers four categories according to the World Bank classification which includes high income countries, upper middle income, lower middle income and low income countries. Um, there is no, uh, it's not a random choice, it's cherry picked so um, let's uh, not worry about, uh, I'm not going to run regressions with it, so I'm okay. So what I'm going to do is present to you, uh, again, a set of images, but I'm going to use something that um, is, is called the aspirational per capita income. Uh, it's going to compare what's happened in the last 40 years between 1978 and 2018. And this, the story we build up is to say that everybody is trying to achieve a certain per capita income and that per capita income which we call the aspirational income 
is the US per capita income, and we've been conservative to say that, let it be the 1978 one, which is approximately $30,000 at uh, uh, 2015 PPP. So that's the benchmark. So the next few slides that you see, you'll see a vertical line in each of those graphs, and that represents the aspirational per capita income. And uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Right. So this is a slide which uh, is not economic, economic in that sense, but it's a bit of geography. And the first thing we asked is, what is the transition of this country if we plot them based on their distance from the equator? So uh, you have a horizontal line which is barely visible out there, but um, it, it, that differentiates countries that largely or their capitals lie whether they are in the uh, above, uh, closer to the equator or further away from the equator. And in 1978, the aspirational US, um, that's on your left, the only country that exceeded that was Saudi Arabia, and we ignored that because it is an oil producing country and therefore doesn't match with any of the other countries really. By, 19, by 2018, a bunch of countries had moved to the uh, northeast quadrant. And all these countries are those that lie beyond the Tropic of Capricorn or, or uh, Tropic of uh, Cancer. And so, so if you're looking at distance from the equator, it, not all the countries that are in the cooler temperate zones made it there, but you see a general trend which, you know, like an exponential graph moving in that direction. So does geography in some ways determine where we are in terms of our per capita incomes? Uh, this is a similar story. I mean, it just matches what you saw in the previous graph. So we plotted maximum temperatures in a country and per capita incomes. And if you allow that loosely assembled uh, regression line or the best fit line, there's a general trend that indicates that there is a downward trend. Again, of course, not all countries that had lower minimum temperatures made it out there in the quadrant down to the right. If we look at urbanization, the story changes in a similar fashion. Countries that have got to the aspirational per capita income by 2018 all have a very high percentage of urbanization. But again, not every country that has high urbanization made it into the aspirational group. Uh, the two big, I must uh, state here that the two big blobs that you see there are India and China. And from the movement, you can probably make out, if not from the, um, you know, the coding that is there for the countries, CN and IN, which countries where. And uh, India is still below the uh, average world uh, share of population right now. Um, so if you look at structural transformation, and this has been a recurring theme in this conference, um, countries that have achieved aspirational incomes have much lower shares of agriculture as a part of their GDP. Again, the qualifier lies that not everybody who has a low per capita, in, per, sorry, share of agriculture and GDP has made it to the aspirational group. If you look at the share of industry, here again, you'll notice that the transition is towards, of, of countries who have higher shares of industry moving into the aspirational group, except there are some where the share of industry is uh, lower than the world average, and these are countries whose share of services is much higher. And if you go to the next one, this is the post-industrial world, where we see that the share of services is really li uh, rising in a significant way. Again, you see an exponential move in, the, in, a, in this fashion. So, the story here is that if India or countries like India, which are trying to achieve higher per capita incomes, are going to uh, move in that aspirational direction, what are the kind of structural changes that we might anticipate or you know hope for if we are going to achieve that? And uh, if we if we look at climate proofing options, there's a whole bunch of them. I've just listed a few again, cherry picked here. If, if one is a policymaker, we can think of investments in green sectors, and that's been talked about by my earlier panelist, San Nicolai, who was there. Expanded irrigation networks to boost uh, agricultural output, 
switch to non-fossil fuels and production, and of course, low emission industrial strategies. Um, how do we get there? Can I, next slide please. So there is a role of the state. And we asked ourselves, you know, if we were to think of what are the roles played by markets and state, the countries that have achieved these aspirational income, uh, you know, status that we talked about are all countries where the state has a significant presence, both in the gross capital formation and in the consumption by government. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So here again, you see that the countries that are making it to the aspirational group, most of them have higher shares of both capital formation as well as consumption by the government. So what do we need? Uh, we need an employment and demand generation strategy. There are developmental challenges. There are urban issues. And of course, there are environmental challenges. And I'm not going to spend time reading this because this has been talked about by people who know this much more than me. Can we go to the next one? So, so the, sorry, not this one, the next one, please. Yes, I was trying to figure out if there's a structure that I can give to the issues that are being raised as part of the work that we do on understanding vulnerability. And it starts from at two ends. And one is exogenous completely, which has to do with climate change. Climate change leads to larger, or will lead to larger extreme events, which puts pressure on vulnerability of the marginalized. And of course, once you get into that zone where it becomes difficult for the marginalized to survive, there's a likelihood that climate change action will recede. It will be a slippery slope out there. On the other hand, we have macroeconomic and open economy uh, policies which are pushing the agenda of social sector reform into a zone which might in turn add to the vulnerability of the marginalized and which again might see a recedence on climate change adaptation and mitigation uh, matters. So on both sides of this, whether you look at the, the blue one or the, or the green boxes, we are in a zone where there is a chance that even though we want it, climate change adaptation and mitigation may not be as simple and easy because it requires a huge amount of uh, political and social will which hasn't, you know, kind of... Uh, stepped up till now and the chances are that the people who are in the margins are likely to be worse off. So if you skip the next slide and go on to the next one. No, this was the first optional stop and I hope I'm far away from my zone of closure. Can I go to the next one? So the next bit of work that I'm going to present is a paper that we did recently on uh, looking at natural disasters and well-being in India. Uh, we basically said that there are three you know, broad categories under which you would encounter uh, effects on uh, your economic, ecolo ecological, and social outcomes as far as natural disasters are concerned. And the state of vulnerability in India is, uh, is pretty big. There are 27 of the 32 states vulnerable to natural disasters. 12% of the land mass is exposed to floods. 68% of the cultivable land is threatened by droughts and this affects food security, livelihood, and assets in rural areas. So India is identified as one of the most vulnerable countries to sea level rise and increased river flooding. Um, we use data from the Indian Human Development Survey. There are two rounds that are available. The great thing about this data set is that you can create a balanced panel across individual household and village level. The data on natural disasters is actually available at the village level, but you have household and individual characteristics that one can merge. That's exactly what we did. We ran a diff and diff model with a bunch of uh, covariates which are listed out there. It's about 15 of them. I'll you know, just request you to believe me that they have most of the stuff that you would bring in in a, uh, in a model where you're trying to predict consumption. Uh, it includes assets, cost, uh, and there's a set of variables that are out there which are called intensity and uh, this is these are created from questions that were asked in the ISDS survey about individuals confidence in certain set of institutions so we we aggregated that and called it confidence intensity uh, there was also a set of questions on conflict in the villages and we aggregate that to create conflict intensity 
there was also a question on number of public projects being carried out in the particular village. That is your public project in intensity. And uh, it also had some questions on social networking, which means that are you a member of the panchayat? Are you a member of the self-help group? So that we aggregated to create a membership intensity characteristic for each household. So uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, I'll skip this. I'll go to the next one. So when we ran this regression, we found that there is a significant negative impact of natural disasters on household consumption, both unadjusted and adjusted for health expenditures. And uh, the second column, which is the MCEPC, which is the unadjusted uh, monthly consumption expenditure per capita. And the third column is the adjusted for health monthly uh, per capita expenditure per month. Next one. So these are uh, take home messages for us. N natural disasters have a negative impact. Well, that's known. But assets, social capital, and insurance helps people overcome uh, exposure to natural disasters and de decline in consumption. The, the relevant question, I think, at the end of the, the, the story that we asked ourselves is, how much does it impact? Right? We, we know that it Im impacts. And we found that adjusted monthly per capita expenditure reduces by 0.7% per year on average per exposure to, nat uh, to natural disaster. So the question that was asked is, did your household get affected by the about six natural disasters that were listed? And so it was like a dummy variable. But we do know that each of these households are responding to such a question. And so 0.7%, you might say, well, it's pretty small. Why should we bother? But you add them up. And you try and remember that our frequency uh, of floods... Pranav, could you, could you take, uh, wind up in a couple of minutes? I can wind up with the next slide. So, so I have that optional stop there. So, so if, you, if you ask yourself, is that small? It, it looks pretty small right now, but you accumulate them, and then that seems to start getting bigger and bigger, especially if, it's, if you're a household that's repeatedly expected, uh, exposed to natural disasters. So I'm going to stop there because... Uh, I have an option to stop after this, so thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Pranab. Um, so, so our next speaker um, is a, a video recording by Diane Archer of the Swedish Environmental Institute. Hello, um, thanks for allowing me to submit a presentation remotely. I'm sorry I couldn't join due to a calendar clash. My name is Diane Archer. I'm a senior research fellow at SEI Asia. So we're based in Bangkok and we're a research to policy organization. Today I'll be talking about some of our work on climate change, air pollution, exposure and livelihoods uh, in Asia. So I will be sharing some findings from two different uh, research projects. The first on climate change, gender equality, and human rights in Asia was a study done for UN Women by some of my colleagues, which I will try and present here. And then on the right-hand side are some outputs from an IDRC-funded project on air pollution in the world of work, which I have been leading for the last couple of years. So I'm sure you're very much aware that air pollution is a major killer uh, in Asia um, and uh, it's very costly both in terms of health costs but also in terms of uh, impacts on GDP. Um, so uh, it's definitely a big issue for the region and while we know the impacts of uh, air, policy, air pollution on human health, um, the associate impacts on the world of work remain understudied. Um, especially in Asia, there's very little evidence of the gendered impacts of poor air quality. 
Um, and there's little on the intersectional impacts on different population groups and different uh, sectors of work. We also have to recognize that uh, informal sector is a huge employer uh, in Southeast Asia, either people working for themselves, for example, as, as street vendors, or working without any formal contract uh, and uh, protection from uh, labor rights uh, for other people. So firstly, just uh, on the climate change front, uh, we know that climate change and air pollution are linked as well, and actions to address air pollution will have co-benefits for climate change and vice versa. Um, we also know that both do not affect people equally, um, and uh, we know that climate change uh, can exacerbate existing gender and social inequalities. And meanwhile, Asia lags behind uh, any meaningful integration of these concerns in climate policies and air pollution policies. So we are interested to know more about the gendered impacts of climate change and air pollution and what this means for policymaking. In terms of the report on climate change, gender and human rights in Asia, the framing uh, was uh, looking at four particular areas of rights, so substantive rights, um, governance and accountability, procedural rights and non-discrimination, and looking at how various socioeconomic factors, um, such as gender, ethnicity, age, education level, um, religion, physical ability, economic uh, status, and so on, can affect uh, the level to which you have um, access to protection um, uh, for your substantive rights and other rights, or uh, the extent to which you can participate in governance and accountability processes. So just a quick summary, uh, climate change, and by extension, I think we can say air pollution, threatens uh, many of our substantive rights, including health, uh, decent work and livelihoods, uh, services and infrastructure, a clean and healthy environment. Uh, governance and accountability, um, on this front, uh, there are still gaps in terms of integrating gender equality and human rights considerations in international frameworks and their implementation. Um, there is also a lack of accountability mechanisms, a lack of consistently enforced uh, laws, um, and this puts particularly particular groups um, uh, at ex ex uh, enhanced risk, so for example, migrant workers, and there's generally a lack of uh, recognition for, for example, customary, customary governance structures or other processes of uh, making your voice heard. With regards to procedural rights, um, there is a lack of access to information in general, whether this is about climate change or uh, about air pollution. Um, and a lack of representation in leadership positions. So, for example, if we're talking about labor, uh, trade unions are um, a key uh, representative group, um, but um, for many workers, especially those in the informal sector, uh, there are no such unions, um, or um, they might not be able to join uh, trade unions where they do exist uh, because of employer regulations. And finally, on dis non-discrimination, uh, we know that certain social groups face higher threats to their human rights um, uh, due to climate change impacts, but also due to uh, exposure to air pollution, and also due to the policies um, that have been developed and implemented to address climate change and air pollution. Um, so determining factors of who will be worse off uh, often comes down to poverty, uh, gender and ethnicity, education levels, but also access to and control of resources like land um, and legal status as well. So uh, again, migrant workers tend to be left behind. So to summarize some of the drivers of gendered inequalities, um, unequal power dynamics, um, both in private and public spheres. This includes uh, gender norms that often result in gender division of labor, so women are expected to be home workers or care workers. Um, migrant and informal workers will tend to be more exploited or more vulnerable to being exploited. Um, then there are exclusionary uh, gender norms and uh, customs that might exclude certain groups from participating in decision-making. 
Um, and then uh, access to resources um, will be differentiated along gender lines as well, as well as marginalized groups often being left behind. Um, and just a note as well, when uh, we're talking about gender, um, this doesn't always specifically mean just uh, men or women, but can also refer to other um, uh, uh, shapers of identity such as uh, age or disability, ethnicity, and so on. So now moving on to the scoping review uh, with regards to air pollution and the world of work. Uh, so this project, as I mentioned, was funded by IDRC. Uh, we started with a literature review to understand the state of uh, knowledge on this topic. Um, and then we used this to inform four key case studies uh, across Southeast Asia. So in terms of the gaps were identified in the scoping review, we uh, know or we found that um, the health impacts will be very much mediated by social axes of stratification, such as class or job roles, gender, age, um, place of residence. But also in reviewing socioeconomic impacts of air pollution, we found four key findings. Um, so firstly, uh, the research around impacts of air pollution is very much framed uh, in a public health and medical way, not in terms of how it affects people's day-to-day -day life or um, the socioeconomic impacts it can have. For example, if during high uh, periods of high air pollution, the uh, policy is to shut down schools, this has knock-on impacts on the primary carers who tend to be women. Secondly, uh, research on air pollution at work mainly fo focuses on formal labor, while informal labor um, tends to be uh, understudied, um, especially in urban settings. Thirdly, we see a strong gender bias in studies. So where women are studied, it's usually in the context of um, them working at home and their exposure to cook stove air pollution. Um, where there is uh, research on occupational exposure um, of women, it tends to focus on how this affects their reproductive health as opposed to other um, aspects of their health. Um, and the research also tends to overlook how men and gender identity can intersect with socioeconomic factors. So for example, men tend to work uh, jobs that are in traffic facing roles where they have high exposure to air pollution, but then they will also be exposed to domestic air pollution, thus uh, doubling uh, their exposure. And fourthly, um, the hierarchies within a sector or within a workplace will also determine exposure to air pollution. And again, this tends to be mediated by factors such as class, gender, uh, education levels. Usually it's the lower skilled workers who are most exposed. So just touching now on some of our case studies uh, in four Southeast Asian countries, um, we basically found that there are differences uh, in exposure between men and women, but that these differences can run both ways. So it's not always men that are more exposed. Um, and uh, for example, uh, in Vientiane, um, our study looking at grilled street food uh, vendors, men were identified as being the preferred uh, chef or griller, therefore working closer to the grill and inhaling more fumes, while women are more likely to work as waitstaff and spend time both around the cooking and non-cooking areas. But they also tended to have longer wait, uh, working hours as they participated in the cleanup of the shop um, afterwards uh, and so on. In the research project in Hanoi in craft villages, um, the men tended to participate more in the hazardous tasks with higher exposure to air pollution, but they also had uh, more vari varied roles. For example, they would also leave the area to do deliveries. However, the women tended to do jobs that were confined to one room and therefore facing a higher concentration of indoor pollution uh, for longer periods. This quote as well on the slide uh, just exemplifies uh, some of the ways that informal workers, uh, even if they are employed um, uh, but uh, without any sort of formal contract, are very much left to their own devices in terms of taking any protective measures or um, looking after their health. So um, there is no uh, burden of uh, care or responsibility from the employers in many cases.
Um, and in, uh, in order to address the drivers of inequalities in air pollution, we found it useful to look at both the structural drivers of air pollution and how this intersects with structural inequalities. So structural drivers um, are a range of factors um, at macro and community level that will perpetuate air pollution. For example, the lack of air pollution legislation or economic development uh, trajectories that uh, favour highly uh, polluting industries. In terms of structural inequalities, uh, we might see, for example, uh, the concentration of certain groups in high exposure occupations um, being mediated by factors like uh, gender, ethnicity, um, and so on. So in terms of the recommendations um, that emerged from our case studies, what we see is that it's crucial to address the gendered impacts um, by addressing the underlying social inequalities and drivers um, uh, of inequalities. Um, and that uh, these need to be considered in policy decisions to ensure inclusive outcomes, uh, especially when considering the transition towards green jobs. So for example, uh, if we phase out uh, all taxis that are older than 20 years, uh, what does this mean for taxi drivers whose car is their key source of livelihood um, and who may not be able to afford uh, a newer car? Uh, what we find um, as well um, is that, uh, for example, uh, youth workers um, had the perception of being invincible to the impacts of air pollution. Uh, exposure. So factors such as age, um, gender, um, all need to be taken into account uh, in policy decisions. Uh, how long do people usually stay in a particular occupation before moving on? Um, we also have to address the lack of awareness uh, in terms of how climate change, uh, how air pollution can affect workers. So, for example, in our um, studies or surveys in Cambodian garment factories, the workers, when asked how is the air quality in your factory, they equated this with temperature rather than uh, pollution levels. Um, and this also means that we have to empower workers uh, to take measures to protect themselves, for example, wearing appropriate filtering masks, but also to uh, push for and participate in the development and implementation of policies um, and this is where representative groups such as trade unions can play a really key role. Also on the side of employers, um, it's really important to raise awareness about the economic impacts or the economic costs associated, associated with air pollution, uh, like sick leave, uh, lost productivity, to persuade uh, employers to develop uh, and implement more policies to protect workers. Secondly, uh, we see informal workers are left out, um, and so we need to ensure policies are updated to protect informal workers, uh, both um, in terms of uh, their rights at work, um, but also in terms of access to healthcare provision, um, and generally knowing uh, what, um, what rights uh, they can uh, have, uh, they do have the right to access um, this. This can be a particular challenge, for example, uh, if we're dealing with informal workers uh, who work at home, um, who uh, we might see uh, don't have a specific employer, but uh, this is where healthcare access policies um, are, and access to sick leave, uh, sick pay um, can play a really key role. Um, and then uh, we also see a challenge in terms of the lack of collaboration between agencies. So this is also an issue with climate change, but in terms of air pollution, there's often not, in, not any integration between environment, health, and labor ministries. Um, and so we need holistic, uh, coordinated policies developed across ministerial sectors, but also with a clear, responsible agency that can ensure accountability and enforcement of policies. And thirdly, um, we need to mainstream provision um, for uh, human rights, gender equality and climate action, but also air pollution uh, throughout all sectoral policies and ensure that national policies align with international commitments on these issues as well. Uh, we need to in have clear um, lines of accountability for implementing and enforcing um, 
also for uh, population groups that might not usually know where to turn to have a voice, so for example, migrant workers and informal workers. And finally, we have to recognize informal workers as key contributors, and we have to protect their rights um, through appropriate policies, but also ensure that they're not harmed in any way in transitions uh, towards cleaner jobs, uh, greener jobs, uh, and greener industries. So to close, if you would like a couple of links uh, to our project page, uh, where you can find uh, resources such as podcasts, uh, online modules, and also a link to the UN Women Report on Gender, Climate Change, and Human Rights. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a great conference.